MMT Models Multidisciplinarity by Pavlina Cherneva. The attacks on MMT are taking a comical turn. A recent one, courtesy of Noah Smith, takes aim at a paper I wrote in the 90s titled Monopoly Money, the State as a Price Setter. It focused on a key MMT idea that the currency issuing monopolist, just like any other monopolist, is a price setter. The economics that I was taught didn't even consider the implications. So I wrote down a few equations to look at different scenarios of prices paid and real resources purchased by a currency issuing government, given the level of aggregate tax liability and private saving desires. The paper was followed by another empirical work from the MMT community. So while I initially started responding to Noah's hysterical blog, I decided to say a few words about the implications of the paper instead and provide a short reading list of other empirical work from MMTers on various topics. Still, Noah isn't getting a pass. Now, all models make simplifications, and all models are flawed, but they can be used to clarify an idea. The important question is, did they attempt to analyze some real-world stylized facts or some fictional story? An example of the latter would be the mainstream model of a shipwrecked Robinson Crusoe who makes production and consumption decisions on a deserted island. I stuck with the real world. The paper starts off with an example where the public sector, the current monopolist, purchases one good, rather a service, from the economy, that of firefighters, and asks how many hours of firefighting labor can the public sector purchase given prices, taxes, and saving desires. For this, Noah is accusing me of modeling an economy in which everyone in the entire economy dies. His emphasis. Heck, I can't think of a more appropriate example. The planet is burning, isn't it? Has Noah forgotten his Econ 101 guns and butter trade-off? That's where an economy can either produce butter, for example, feed its people, or guns, for example, wage endless wars. But so long as any on combination of the two goods lies of the production Possibilities Frontier, PPF, the economy would be allocating its resources efficiently. Generations of students were initiated into an economics with this model the effect of which was to teach them an unexam unexamined acceptance of morally reprehensible expenditures and investments as efficient market outcomes. In this case, on war, but you can substitute fossil fuel production, incarceration, or anything else into the PPF. Maybe I should have stuck with orthodoxy and used guns so that Noah's dramatic conclusion that my model is an employment of doom makes it a bit more sense. I chose firefighters. I thought they were saviors, not mercenaries. Next, Noah wants you to believe that my one good model is people who are effectively doing slave labor for the government because of some quotes in the paper on taxation in colonial Africa. This argument is so inane that it doesn't merit a reply so here is some background for the MMT curious with links. My paper does not start with quotes from prominent scholars about how taxes were used in colonial Africa to create demand for the colonizer's currency, which also gave rise to cash crops and wage labor. The point was to show an example of the coercive nature of taxation. Is there one person who disagrees with the statement that taxes are coercive? Taxes are compulsory, they are not reciprocal, and this is true for democratic societies or authoritarian ones. When I first heard Warren Mosler's argument that people used a given currency because their taxes were denominated in it, I thought it was the most implausible idea. But then I started digging. My undergraduate professor, Matt Forstadter, sent me direct historical evidence of how taxes could 
and have been used to require people to use an otherwise useless to them currency. The case of colonial Africa. I pass these examples on to Charles Goodhart, who, lo and behold, cited them in his seminal paper, The Two Concepts of Money. Lucky for him, Noah hasn't discovered his paper yet. And thus began the MMT research project on the history of money. There are, of course, many democratic examples of the tax-driven nature of currencies. Take the example of the Argentinian provinces, which in the depths of the 2001 crisis launched their own currencies, patacones. They did this by requiring citizens to pay local taxes and utility bills in the new currency, and then by paying state employees and contractors in the new currency. I was in Argentina at that time and can vouch that people didn't like it, but storefronts were plastered with signs, we accept patacones. Then I found an argument put forth by Ben Franklin, a well-known advocate of paper money, that it is the future repayment of taxes that gave it value. In other words, taxes were used not to fund the states. Indeed, the colonies could not collect taxes before they had spent the cur paper currency first, but to maintain the currency's value by removing some of it from circulation. In a subsequent paper on the relationship between power and money, I argue that political sovereignty is never fully complete without monetary sovereignty, and that the right to issue and control a nation's currency was a critical victory for former colonies in their battle for economic independence. In the U.S., we fought a war, in part, to acquire the right to issue currency in response to the Currency Acts of 1751 and 1764. No taxation without representation. So, yes, currencies are acceptable because of the tax requirement, no matter if the state is a democratic one or not. And if we are serious about democratizing money, given that it's born out of this tax relationship, we must also ensure that it is employed to serve the public good and eliminate the very unemployment it creates. Furthermore, democratizing money cannot be done without democratizing labor. As I argued recently at Christine Dessan's Harvard Conference on Money as a Democratic Medium, while colonial Africa was among the first examples we found, research on the origins of money confirmed and reconfirmed the taxes drive money mechanism. We dug deeper and wrote a ton on the history of and history of thought on money. These papers, books, dissertations by Charles Goodhart, Matt Forstadter, Randy Ray, John Harry, Eric Timoin, Ala Semenova, myself, are all a small selection. Innes, Knapp, and Keynes offered important insights, but modern economists were of no use. After all, they relied on fictitious barter neutral money models. Farley Grubb was a rare exception. We searched the other disciplines and found more evidence that money did not emerge spontaneously from markets or barter, but from the powers of the state, very broadly defined to impose non-reciprocal obligations on its subjects. We found the work of historians, anthropologists, sociologists who provided evidence for and corroborated some of our arguments. Philip Grierson, Viviana Zilizer, Michael Hudson, Christine Dessan, David Graeber, and others. We learn from their work and that of others, though I'm certainly not suggesting they endorse or agree with everything in MMT. Colleagues from law, political studies, humanities, finance, etc. joined us, and the MMT project became truly multidisciplinary. Fellow MMT travelers, too, many to list here, converged at the first two MMT conferences and Chris DeSan's workshop. Others called on their own disciplines to reclaim the study of money. For example, read Rebecca Spang's recent appeal to historians. To sum up, taxes drive money in virtually all economic historical contexts, whether Noah gets it or not. 
and even a high schooler would understand that modeling this stylized fact is not endorsing a genocidal regime. So here is a very short summary of some of the implications of the paper he is criticizing, followed by a short list of other MMT empirical work on a variety of topics. Monopoly money, the state as a price setter. Not a single firefighter was harmed in this exercise or enslaved to work for the state. What are the questions? One, standard economics talks about monopoly, but ignores the one pure case of a monopoly, that of the currency. Two, there is still no recognition that the tax creates a type of monetary unemployment, distinct, though in my view, not incompatible with Keynes's. The obligation to pay the tax in a given currency creates offers for, sa for sale of goods and services in that currency. 3. The government can choose the manner in which to purchase those goods and services and thereby provide adequate amount of currency to the population to satisfy the tax. If it does not, Ill involuntary unemployment results. 4. The government has the responsibility to resolve the unemployment it has created. 5. If it doesn't, the level of employment and unemployment in the co economy will be indeterminate, especially given uncertain saving desires. 6. The government has the option and ability to employ the unemployed directly. 7. As the currency monopolist, it could determine the price of the labor and let the budget float to accommodate the tax bill or saving, saving desires. We call this the fixed price floating quantity rule. 8. Today, the government chooses not to do that. Instead, it spends on a flo floating price fixed quantity rule. It constrains the budget, pays market prices for goods and services, and fails to solve the problem of unemployment as above. 9. My paper looks at different scenarios that have implications for the fixed budget floating budget options and considers questions like how many resources could be transferred to the public sector given a certain aggregate tax liability and in which case is that amount indeterminate. 10. Finally, it raises questions like if the state can set prices, should it? And if so, which ones? The upshot is that there is an inverse relationship between the price the government pays for goods and services and the quantity of real goods and services it receives for a given level of taxation and net saving desires. Constraining the budget creates unemployment and underprovisions the government. It ins if instead the government allowed its budget to float, it could design a counter-cyclical policy such as the job guarantee that would be a superior price anchor and automatic stabilizer, which I modeled in a subsequent paper. So unlike basic neoclassical PPF models that pass objectionable trade-offs as efficient, the job guarantee explicitly rejects the use of unemployment for economic stabilization purposes. Later, Warren Mosler and Damiano Silippo published another empirical analysis on the precise question, the price-setting power of government and its policy prerogative to adopt a fixed price floating quantity rule in the Journal of Policy Modeling. They showed how the job guarantee, they call it a transition job offer, can be used to enhance the ECB's single mandate for price stability and why it was superior to other alternatives. The implication from these two models is that government policy and prices paid by government are the ultimate source of the price level. Far from the economics of doom, MMT points to superior policies for full employment and price stability. Addendum. Here is a very brief reading list of other empirical MMT work, a sample of the wide variety of methods and topics to which it has been applied. 
This scratches the surface of the empirical or analytical work of MMT. Also, the list is confined to the UMKC MMT crowd. You should look up the volume vol you should look up the voluminous work of Bill Mitchell, his blog, research center, and book publications, and that of fellow travelers who have their own research programs, for example, bond economics. Textbooks. 1. Macroeconomics by Mitchell, Ray, and Watts. 2. Money and Banking by Timonia. Research Papers. Fed Treasury Operations, Fiscal and Monetary Policies. 3. Do Taxes and Bonds Finance Government Spending by Bell Kelton. 4. Fiscal Effects on Reserves and Fed Independence by Ray and Bell Kelton. 5. MMT and Fed Treasury Operations by Timonia. 6. Helicopter Drops are Fiscal Operations by Fulweiler. 7. Time to Rain in the Fed by Fulweiler and Ray. 8. Quantitative Easing and Proposals for Reform of Monetary Policy Operations by Fulweiler and Ray. 9. Treasury Debt Operations an analysis integrating social fabric matrix and social accounting matrix methodologies by Fulweiler. 10. Functional finance and the debt ratio by Fulweiler. 11. Sector financial balances, model of aggregate demand and austerity by Fulweiler. 12. Sustainable fiscal policy and interest rates under flexible exchange rates by Fulweiler. 13. Monetary mechanics, a financial view by Timonia. 14. Interest rates and fiscal sustainability by Fulweiler. 15. Yes, deficit spending adds to private financial assets even with bond sales by Kelton. 16. Debunking the public debt and deficit rhetoric by Timonia. Exogenous pricing. Number 17. Monopoly money, the state as a price setter by Cherneva. 18. Maximizing Price Stability in a Monetary Economy, Mosler and Salipo. On the ELR Job Guarantee, 19. Job Guarantee, Public Service Employment, by Ray, Dantas, Fulweiler, Cherneva, Kelton. 20. Macroeconomic Stabilization Through an Employer of Last Resort, by Fulweiler. 21. The Costs and Benefits of a Job Guarantee, Estimates from a Multi-Country Econ Econ Econometric Model by Fulweiler. 22. Employer of Last Resort, a case study of Argentina's Jefe's program by Cherneva and Ray. 23. ELR-led economic development, a plan for Tunisia by Kaboob. On unemployment, on unemployment, inequality, social security, poverty, housing, financial instability. Number 24. Full Employment, Inflation, and Income Distribution by T Cherneva. 25. A Hard-Nosed Look at Worsening U.S. Household Finance by Timonia. 26. $29 Trillion, A Detailed Look at the Fed's Bailout by Felkerson. 27. Who Gains When Income Grows by Cherneva. 28. Does Social Security Need Saving by Ray. 29. Central Banking, Asset Prices, and Financial Fragility by Timonia. 30. Measuring Macroprudential Risk Through Financial Fragility, a Minskian Approach by Timonia. Okay, that's for starters.